let's prepare everything because we have to move. We have already some delay. Let's hope that now the presentation is ready. Let's see <laughs> what is going to happen. Still, still a few minutes or what? Oh, but now we are, what do I do? So let, let, let's wait a little bit, seems that there are still some problems. Has to solve this problem. If she cannot stand, this is not connected. What is going on? Okay, now all is really ready. So then we can proceed with the first lecture of this session. The first lecture will be given by our guest, Ada Yonat, Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Then I, I, we were already going through his career, his uh, achievement. I want just to say some two more words from, from, the, the, from the, the discussion, from when she was getting the Nobel Prize, they, they were saying, from her studies on the structure and function of the ribosome, for her studies, I would like to cite some famous mathematician that was always saying, I was studying, I was studying, I was studying, at a certain point I realized, Maybe there is something that doesn't work. At that time, it was say, I become a scientist. And our other is an example of this kind of attitude. The, the second thing that I want to say is that on this, this written that this, uh, on the structure and function of the ribosome. Structure and function are really two simple words. But when you put together, you open the door to a universe of new knowledge. So thanks a lot for this. So then, I suppose, now we are really ready to listen to your talk. So thanks a lot. The podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Do you hear? Do you hear at the end? Good. Thank the organizers for the invitation and thank you for sharing. And uh, I wanted to talk about from basic science to modern medicine, because I think it's, it's important. But on the way to India, I remember a lot of contacts that I had with Indians. And one of them was from Madras, not far from here, now called Chennai. And I wanted to make a little bit longer a title, from basic science to modern medicine and from collagen to the striking ribosome structure. So I'm not sure that you all know what is collagen. Probably you heard a lot about it from the cosmetic point of view and um, 
surgery point of view, it's, it's the skin, it's the skin uh, uh, um, protein. It also exists in inside cells. And it, it, it's rather simple as we look at it now, but it was a big challenge back in the 50s and 60s of last, last century. It's a triple helix. I'm sure you all heard about the double helix of DNA. It's a triple helix, like you can see here on top. And it was a, a, a subject of my own PhD, but also of the research of Professor G.N. Ramachandran from Madras, whom I thought will be, will be fair to mention here. So you can see his picture here and collagen and double helix, alpha helix next to it. Jian Ramachandran was a genius in my opinion with having only a few structures, maybe two or three structures of proteins. He found out, I'm not sure that this is seen. Maybe we try this better, yeah. He found out that there are only specific possibilities of the bond that combines two amino acids together to make a dead peptide and longer, and made maps of it in the beginning, simple maps, and he ended up with a 360 degrees map on both directions, which is uh, showing where proteins can be, only very little region of it, and it's called, until now, the Ramachandran plot. And everybody that had anything to do with amino acids or proteins or just studied it, studies what it is. And please remember, he did it without computers, without uh, ways of, of uh, high-level computing. So here he is. He was an established scientist in India, in, in Madras, but also he got a position, joint position from the University of Chicago, and I was first year student, PhD student. And we had a sort of co competition. I don't want to talk about the competition. I just want to tell you, to show you what we used as our data. So the data that he had, it's shown here. It's a fiber diffraction with one, two, three, four, five different reflections. I had a better, a, a better a, a starting model, not my work. I got it. And I had a much more de, a detailed map. I, I'm not sure that you can detail diffraction. I'm not sure you can see here much, but you can see these lines that show where, where there are reflections. I had 14 reflections, not only three, and very, uh, they were very faint, but very uh, sharp. So I could work out the structure very carefully, and indeed it, brought, it became correct. Why do I show you all this now? I want to show you how we started with ribosomes. Please remember this very poor diffraction. This is what I got, I got from the first crystals of ribosomes. You see here very faint line, and here two, three, and on this I based my, my hopes that I'll be able to see how ribosome is being built. I'll come back to ribosomes in a minute. I just want to tell you that a little bit later, a few years later, I could get two-dimensional uh, sheets of ribosomes, and now I had much better diffraction and all this structure that is a, a very nice monolayer, very well oriented. So when I came here yesterday, I started to ask people, actually I looked into it earlier, but I wasn't sure I found it. I asked people, what is nanomaterials? What are nanomaterials? And they told me that they are described in principle as materials of which a single unit is sized up to 100 nanometers, which means 1,000 angstroms. Ribosomes, these very complicated structures, are smaller, between 200 to 400 angstroms. 
So now can you tell me that I don't work on nano, nano materials? I can even pack them nicely. And I want to show you some more nice packing. Look, wonderful. And here, this is the enlargement of that. And a lot of diffraction. So please accept me to the nano com com community and let me continue with ribosomes. <laughs> so what are ribosomes? Uh, I'm sure you all know about DNA. You know the DNA is made of, of uh, nucleotides. You know the DNA uh, is a very long, long fiber, but it also has the genes. It contains the genes of all proteins of this particular uh, cell that the DNA is in. And the genes are here. The, the codes are here. I'm sure you know that there are 200 sorry, that there are 20 amino acids, different amino acids, and only four letters in all biology. And each combination of three of them can code for an amino acid. This, this I think, uh, is now studied in, in high schools. Uh, so the, the nucleotides are here, and they make base pairs, and here are the genes. Here there is the information for how to build a new protein. Proteins are usually of a length between 60, which is the smallest, insulin, and 500, which are uh, many more proteins in, somewhere in between. But the information for them is here, but it's not available because it's covered. So the first thing that happens, they are being transcribed to a similar molecule called RNA, in this particular case, messenger RNA. Again, four letters only, three of them exactly like DNA, one of them slightly different chemically, but not very different. The, the difference between RNA and DNA is not in the nucleotides, it is in this chain. It can, it is a ribonucleic acid that can exist as a single chain, Whereas DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid, and it, it folds into double helical almost always. So here the information is available, can be being translated to proteins by a universal particle called ribosome. It's, as I told you, it fits into biomachine, a nanomachine. So there is a huge number of ribosomes that function in each living cell. Mammalian cells may contain, contain millions of them, like in the liver, there are four, five millions of ribosomes in each cell. Even in bacteria, 80 to 100,000. All ribosomes perform their two major functions. The decoding is one function, and peptide bond formation, it means the bond between the amino acids, the newly protein, they do it almost the same. In vivo, they, ask, they act continuously, and they can form up to 40 peptide bonds in one second with hardly any mistake, one to a million. So may I tell you something about myself? I was a very fast student. I was the fastest in my class, not because I was so good, because I was very poor, and I had many jobs, and I had to to make money, to support myself, my studies, and so on. So I, I had to make the whole group, had to make the whole class one, a single peptide bond. And I was the fastest, you know how long it took me? Six hours. And they can make 40 in one second. Chemistry developed, now one can make a bond in two hours, but not up to 40 in a second. So now that we know how the ribosomes are built, and also within almost no time we understood how they function. We like to describe them as factories made of two floors. At the top floor, the information is being decoded, is being read, so the messenger RNA comes in to the top floor. And in the lower floor, the peptide bond is being made, so the amino acids are being brought by trucks, it's a factory, each truck is a tRNA, another transfer RNA molecule, which are almost the same in all, in all cells for all amino acids. They, they are different mainly 
by their, by their uh, uh, decoding part and by the amino acid. I won't talk much about them, but they can come in. And when there is here a, a sequence, a triplet, that codes for this amino acid, it will come in and be connected to the newly grown protein. So I don't know to, to draw inside. Please, please forgive me for outside, but it happens in the, inside the, the, the factory in the lower floor. Then the truck can go out empty. The code can uh, progress by a triplet. The protein is longer and it all costs very little energy. Isn't it very efficient and very clever? Nature is clever. It took us 20 years to discover that. Anyway, the two floors here, the top and the bottom, are actually a part of the ribosomes. All ribosomes are built of two subunits that associate only when they have to make a protein. Otherwise, they are independent. The small subunits decodes the genetic information and the large forms the peptide bond. So if we, we want to look at each, it's bacterial ribosome now. The top floor is the small subunit. The lower is the large subunit. tRNA, which is decoding here, brings the amino acid here. So the connections are according to the size, to the structure, and also according to the, to the uh, job. The job up is decoding and down is making the peptide bond. So once we understood the structure and we saw how nice it is and how clever it is, we got together with two young students of the Art Academy in Jerusalem and we made a little clip and it's available in YouTube. So have a look. Messenger RNA is reaching the small subunit and gets into its path. And this is controlled by initiation factor number three, which is the blue point in the, in the right side. So now it is in, and everything is fine. The first tRNA can be brought in by initiation factor number two and be connected to its position. So it can, be, it can, it can be now be busy in decoding. Once all, once all of this is okay, the, the factors left and the large subunit can come and make bridges to the small one, either real, real bridges chemically or a surface by surface. And uh, the, the active ribosome has been made. So you can see it now from the solvent side, the up, the up part is the large subunit, the lower is the small. From the left, Amino acids are being brought on tRNA with elongation factors. These are the blue things over there. And the ribosome helps in, out, in, out, really machine, 40 times a second. Now we took away the large subunit. You can see the decoding happens up and peptide bond is happening down. From the whole large subunit, we left only the tunnel through which the new protein comes out. And the process continues until there is a stop codon, it means the end of, the, of, of the, this gene. Protein comes out, this blue thing down there, and can fold as it needs, alone or with chaperones. And the whole thing continues and continues until there is the, a, an end. And in, in, this type, in this time, factors like this yellow thing come in, release and recycling. The two subunits are now a, a dissociate, the protein, this blue thing, a, is folded and the whole system is waiting for the next, for the next job, that's all. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all. Science is really clever. Maybe I should say nature is clever. Anyway, in the, pic, in the pictures until now, in the movies, you saw something fuzzy. Actually, we know the position of each and every atom. Ribosomes are made mainly of RNA, this is the gray, and of many proteins, each is shown here in a different color. In bacteria, 54 proteins, in higher organisms, up to 85 proteins. And you see here the small subunit and the large subunit. Here is the decoding and here is the bonding. Owing to its vital role played by the ribosome, 
almost 40%, almost half of the clinically useful antibiotics target protein biosynthesis, mainly by paralyzing the ribosome. It's very clever. You know that the natural, this clever thing, the natural antibiotics are the weapons that microorganisms from one type are using it to interfere with life of other type. The antibiotics are made naturally by bacteria or other uh, uh, microorganisms. And the question to answer, how do the small ones paralyze the whole ribosome? So the tiny antibiotics paralyze ribosomes by binding to functional sites. You can see here the large subunit and the small subunit, the skeleton of them, and these circles that show when where antibiotics bind. And most of them bind either the decoding or in the bonding or in the channel or in the hinging or what I didn't show here in the entrance of the tRNA. Really very, very clever natural products. So when, when we saw the structures I must say that I didn't even dream about being able to understand the antibiotics, but we do. And we made a little clip with the same two students, and you can see four examples for antibiotics. So this is adenine, which disturbs the messenger RNA entrance. See, so small and so clever. The second is even smaller, it's called tetracycline and it disturbs the uh, accommodation of the second tRNA. It actually occupies its position. This is the green thing. So only one, one uh, tRNA can bind, and the bond cannot be made between one to one. The third one that you will see is actually the first that went into use after penicillin, it's called erythromycin and it sits in the tunnel. See, that's it. Only very short protein can be, can be made, five to seven bones. And the last one is from the chemical point of view, the cleverest, it's really clever. Goes exactly into the bone. So have a look. just in the bond, doesn't let the bond be made. So um, antibiotics for clinical use, which I just described now, uh, are those that we can use them and they, dis they distinguish between the bacteria, the pathogen, and the patient. We don't want to, to kill the patient, only the pathogen. So uh, since most of the Active sites are highly conserved. Only minute variations are, are a, a enough to distinguish between binding or not binding of the antibiotic. Let me show you an example. So if this is the large subunit and we cut it this way, <coughs> this will be the tunnel and protein will go out from here if the tunnel is empty. But if erythromycin sits here, that's its position, there it will block. So actually, we decided to look at this position uh, vertical to the long axis of the tunnel. And what we saw is the tunnel walls, which act here like a, a big pocket to bind all types of antibiotics from the family of erythromycin. You can see they, they, they block excellent, they block just very good, but they all block by interacting with specific amino acid in this position, so a specific nucleotide in this position, which is adenine in position 2058. And the affinity between erythromycin and adenine here is very, very high, fantastic, as if a really, really good bioinformatic person de uh, um, de designed it. What's the difference between bacteria and higher organisms like the patients? That's all. A to G. That's all. But there is a G here. When there is a G here, it's too close. The distance here is too close and there is rejection. So that's all. That's the whole difference between bacteria in us and there is the way of using it. 
Resistance to antibiotics is one of the most severe problems in modern medicine. And it was found that it is also bacterial, bacterial uh, design. Bacteria, the, uh, the uh, uh, delegation went to the jungles of Venezuela and found and found people that had never had any, any Western food or, or medicine, and still they found genes for resistance. So bacteria profit from accidental mutations or develop specific molecular pathways that cause resistance. And I will show you just one quickly. You remember this, the, the basis of selectivity, A and G? What's the big deal? Bacteria becomes G itself. That's all. Now it is resistant. So the increasing appearance of multi-drug resistance, not even to one drug, together with the minimal, actually negligible number of new antibiotic drugs that are now in development of companies, companies do not want to make new antibiotics, are, in my opinion, a very, very bad, a very bad situation. Let's call it like this. You want some numbers? In the USA, two million people fall ill infections diseases every year in the last five years. In Europe, between 2010 and 2014, 33,000 deaths were reported yearly, alongside with 1.6 billion euros and a lot of health care costs and so on. Although the amount of, of uh, antibiotics was doubled in this time. So it seems that we will soon revert back to the prebiotic area during which diseases caused by parasites or by simple or severe infections like pneumonia or even wounds were almost untreatable. Therefore, the World Health Organization announced that we are now reaching the post-antibiotic era, and consequently, the World Bank estimated that up to 3.8% of the global economy will be lost by 2050 because of resistance to antibiotics. Actually, the number is now higher, but still not published, or I didn't write it. Yet, very few antibiotics are in development by companies, and I want to show you this. This is the a growth of, of a resistance of three different bacteria, pathogen, and this is the amount of new antibiotics. Last one in 2007, one. That's it. So first of all, I want to tell you what I feel about the possibility to combat resistance to antibiotic completely. My feeling, and it's personal, but I, I think it's, a, it's based on, on numbers, it's unlikely because bacteria want to live and because bacteria are cleverer than us, at least in terms of survival. So uh, what is our, we, as I told you, we do some things. What is our concept of fighting or controlling bacteria's wisdom? We are trying to identify pathogen-specific essential structural motifs. So, uh, our modest contributions towards this is shown below, and I won't give you all the details. Just tell you that we determine the structures of ribosomes from pathogenic bacteria and compare them to ribosomes from harmless bacteria. We learn many lessons. The general lesson is that all bacterial ribosomes are similar, but not identical. Then I don't want to show you all the lessons. Jump to lesson number four. It's beyond my expectations, like a dream for me. We found novel antibiotic binding sites. So I will try to show you if it works. Well, does not, but I can show you not rotating. So you see here the skeleton of the large subunit in gray of bacteria, normal, normal harmless bacteria, and additions here and here and here and here and here in cyan, which are specific to this particular uh, pathogen, which is called Staph aureus. It's all less than 8%. Statistically, 
we, didn't, we were not encouraged by the statistic people. But if we look at them, each of them has a structure. Each of them is made of RNA, which is not connected. So let's focus on one of them. You see the, the neighborhood, the pathogen and the model are the same. But here there is an a different, a, a, a additional piece, which has a, its own structure and it is available. So we think that it can be a potential binding site. So in a model system, we identified 25 new potential binding sites, unique ones, and we blocked them one by one chemically, and 16 of them stopped protein biosynthesis. So uh, these sites are not involved in the primary ribosomal activity, therefore there are not yet any, any genes for their uh, changing, for their modification. So this means that we can, for now, use these sites and exploit them for the design of advanced degradable antibiotics, hence and uh, environmental friendly. I didn't talk about this, I just want to say a few words about selectivity of this site. You know about the microbiome, I'm sure you know that there are zillions of good, uh, good bacteria within our body, actually in the flora of semi-exposed mammalian organs, like guts, ears, lungs, and skin. These are good ones. They can be uh, destroyed by the currently used antibiotics, but we can design those that will not destroy them. Also, some environmental and ecological considerations. So most of the ribosomes that are currently in use have inside them, they are, uh, are grown around a, a, um, organic molecules, small organic molecules that cannot be digested and they are not degradable. It means when they, when they leave the body of the human or the animal and reach, and reach the, the environment, because they are so small, sometimes they, in, in, the, the systems that are, are purifying the this, this sewage cannot catch them because they are too small, and then they penetrate into the irrigated irrigation systems, and we get them back, and they make it without our, our food, grass or milk or so on, and they increase the resistance. These particular positions that I showed earlier we can decide what is the chemistry that we want. We don't, we don't have to use these little pieces inside. We can do chemistry that we want to do, or we can do. So, so far, the inhibition of protein biosynthesis by the newly identified potential sites was achieved by molecules that were composed of nucleic acids or oligopeptides or co combinations of them or sim similar to them. And uh, this can be not only uh, degradable, but can also be optimized in terms of chemical properties, antibiotic action, and degradability. So this is what we are doing now. I hope that I told you that ribosomes that are really, really uh, nano, nanoparticles can do lots of good things, and we can do lots of good things listening to them. Uh, studying them, I want to thank, before I finish, to thank the Weizmann Institute for letting me work on dream or fantasies. The um, president was Michael Sella, a biologist. They told me that he allows me because he's a biologist, but he was replaced by high-energy high physicist, Chaim Harari, they didn't stop me. And he was encouraged by the scientific advisory committee that say the project like this shouldn't be stopped. But the chances that Ada makes it are not very high. It all started, started with a very strong and fruitful collaboration with Max Planck for molecular genetics in Berlin. The director of, of, of this uh, uh, group, this Max Planck Institute, was Professor Wittmann. He really wanted to see what, how the ribosomes look. But he died 10 years before we did it. He was replaced by Franceschi and then by Fuccini. He was also very important in starting a group for us in DAISY in Hamburg, where we measure 
So I had two groups together in, in Germany and in Israel. I won't show you the group in Germany that terminated 15 years ago, but I want to thank the members of this group and of the Israeli group, which you can see here. Uh, this, this, uh, I'm showing here people that have already left, but are still uh, uh, important for us. My, my picture is here, but actually the group is run by Dr. Anad Bashan. She is doing everything. And recently, the last three years, we had two excellent, unbelievable um, Indian scientists, Tanaya Bos and Nikita, who is standing here with our shirt. We have a ribosome shirt uh, with this picture on it. I want to show you Tamar. Tamar had a birthday when I took this picture and she baked a cake for her birthday. You see the cake? Maybe not good enough. This is her cake. <laughs> and it shows that ribosomes are sweet in, in our lab. Uh, I also want to, to thank my family, my mother, sister, and so on, my daughter and my granddaughter. They were all very supportive, although I wasn't always with them. My granddaughter wrote a little speech for me when I got a a prize in Paris, and she read it. As you know, she is a very busy scientist, but she always finds time for me. And therefore, I invited her at the age of five to the kindergarten. She gave me a prize. This is not her prize, that's the Nobel Medal. Her prize, for me, is more important. Thanks a lot, ma'am, for showering us with knowledge. I, I need another half a minute. Her prize is... <laughs> is much more important for me, or at least more important. And there is no year here. So I ask her, the grandma of the year, which year? And she said, which year? You have to reprove yourself every year. And if you fail, I'll take it off the wall. And it's already 13 years old, the wall. Ribosomes became popular in Israel. This is a, a um, carnival. He is me. And she is wife. You see, they are dancing here. She is ribosome. <laughs> Michelle Kishka, who is one of our most uh, beloved uh, um, artists, made this, this uh, picture of me. Have a look. Small subunit, <laughs> large subunit, small and large and large, and he thinks new antibiotics should be here and there. Thank you. Thanks a lot, ma'am, for sharing knowledge with us, and you are a packet of joy. I hope everyone understands what ma'am is trying to say. And now moving forward to the plenary talk, will be given by Dr. Yuri Govotsi on the topic rise of Mexine. We would like to request Dr. Bruno to give a brief introduction. Thank you. Okay. I don't want to have a, okay. Very nice, really yeah. inspirational. Yeah. Okay. What has happened uh, to the uh, uh, HDMI cable? Yes. Um, the cable should I? Uh, there was an HDMI cable before. This one? This one? This one? No. Uh, no, no. Uh, this one? This one? This one? Uh, no. Yuri is Yuri. No, okay. I, I will bring another one, yeah. Oh, okay. No, no, no. Let me just take another connector then. If we are switching to the J. Okay. Okay, yeah, seeing the box, yeah. Is it there? Okay, perfect. So, let's move on. Thanks once more to our previous speaker, Ada, for being so perfect with time. So, thank, thanks a lot once more for that. So then, we move to the next lecture, the next lecture will be given by Yuri Gogossi, 
from the Drexel University, and I want to add some few comments to his brilliant work. And I'm saying that we, we were already hearing that Professor Yuri Gogosi was a part of a team that discovered a new family of two-dimensional materials, carbides and nitrides, and mexin, mexins are called, that they show exceptional property, you see, for energy storage. So this means that I, I really hope that this potential will be shortly transformed into reality and especially I really hope that this will give rise to new, a new class of devices able really to consume a very small amount of energy and a very small amount of materials. Because this will be really the key points, the key contribution of science to develop a new world based on green energy, a new world really sustainable from, ever, from material and energy point of view. So then, let's give now the podium to Professor Yuri Gogosi. Thanks. Uh, uh, Bruno, thank you very much for your kind introduction. I would also like to thank once again Dr. Grace for inviting me giving me opportunity for the first time to come to Velour and uh, meet all of you and give this presentation. Um, Rick Smalley, who discovered fullerenes uh, a long time ago, 1985, and worked uh, on carbon nanotubes, being one of the founders really of the nanotechnology, nanomaterials uh, uh, field used to talk that nanotechnology has two sides, a soft side where people work on polymers, proteins, DNA, use DNA, for example, to uh, align uh, and assemble nanoparticles, and a hard side, inorganic material side. You just heard a very inspirational, really wonderful talk about the soft size of nano on uh, biomolecules. I'm going to talk about the other side, which is equally important in technology about inorganic materials, nanomaterials here. Moreover, if you work in the field of uh, nanomaterials, particular carbon materials, you know that uh, it all started probably with those fullerenes discovered, discovered by Croto and Smalley, C60, and a whole family of uh, related Molecules that it went from zero dimensional fullerenes to one dimensional nanotubes. And since 204, after uh, Andrew Geim and uh, Kostin Vasolov showed new physical properties of graphene, this material shown here in the middle, here, uh, pretty much attention of the world has been attracted to two dimensional materials. And one of the reasons is that. They have a whole variety of electronic properties. There are many of them. As I mentioned, we live in the time of discovery. They are very thin. They are flexible. They are very well compatible with flexible electronics everyone is trying to develop nowadays here. And actually, they have high surface area, which allows using energy storage, adsorption, catalysis, many other applications. But moreover, what is very, very important, Graphene was really the first one. But already at the time, boronitride, metal dichalcogenide, transition metal dichalcogenide, clays, oxides have been known, existed. People rediscovered them. They started to play with other 2D materials, showing they also can have useful properties. And what is important, you can build out of 2D material, like brick after brick, putting together like a building a wall, and create nanostructures with combination of properties that no single material alone can deliver here. But what is more interesting, researchers realize that many materials can be made in 2D, black phosphorus, two-dimensional layers of gold, metal organic frameworks, Silicine, germanine, borophine, 
number of other materials were created with from structures which don't have layered precursors with Vic van der Waals bond, unlike a graphene or TMDs. So the community realized it's possible to make a lot of different materials as seen few atoms thick or even monatomic sheets here. And in uh, 2010, working with my colleague, Professor Michelle Barzuma at Drexel University, now a student, Michael Nagib, we discovered an entirely new family of two-dimensional materials, carbides and nitrides of transition metals, which no one ever expected even to be uh, available in a two-dimensional state. And I'm going to talk to you today about this wonderful materials, at least in my opinion, and I will try to convince you uh, that it's true, what they're good for, what they can do. And if you want to read a little bit more, this article, actually this is just an editorial with less than two pages of text and a few pictures, is a very good starting point to read about them. It was published uh, about two months ago uh, in uh, uh, ACS Nano uh, here. But Already a year before that, in 2017, CNN, which is a bulletin of the American Chemical Society, going to about uh, uh, 150,000 members, published an article on 2D materials going beyond graphene. And Mitch Jacobi, uh, uh, who is a journalist, science journalist writing this article, talked to a number of nanoscientists, asking which material are the most promising after graphene. And what is interesting? You see, Maxines are opening this article. Maxines appeared on the cover of the special issue of ACS Nano. And really, this was about the time when a number of research groups and publications working on the topic started to grow up quickly from initially a limited number of groups here. So, what are those materials I'm talking about here? They're carbides and nitrides of transition metals. They're atomically thin, few atoms thick, just like other 2D materials, typically less than one nanometer in thickness. But they have a few features that no other known material has. One of them, first, most of them, not all, but most of them, in terminated stage, uh, are metals. They have a conducting carbide cores. And actually these large golden spheres are transition metal atoms I'm showing to you. The small dots in the middle, the black one, uh, they are carbon and nitrogen. And I'm showing the surface termination by OH group because we produce them by wet, by wet chemical synthesis here. So they are conducting inside, but on the surface they look like clay or graphene oxide. But in graphene oxide, if you put functional group on the surface, conductivity drops by several order of magnitudes here. Moreover, their surface can be changed, modified chemically, without killing the conductivity of this material. And this is very, very interesting because in case of, say, redox storage in battery supercapacitor, we can change oxidation state, we can store energy, but the material still remains conductive, making quickly charging, second charging time batteries possible here. What is also interesting, the common three groups, three flavors, we call them two one structures because of two atom of transition metal, one layer of carbon nitrogen, three two structures, four three structures here. So what's Maxine mean? M stands for transition metal, X is carbon and nitrogen, and in ending initially taken for graphene from organic chemistry, but now used simply to show two dimensionality, like borophene, silicene, germanine, and other materials here. Titanium 32 was the first one that Michael Nagib discovered and in 2010 at the end, and we published this paper in one's material 211. This is a cover of this first article. During his PhD study, he produced a dozen of those two-dimensional materials here. So basically, we have materials which can call like a metallic clay. Clay, water-soluble, because it has OH or oxygen on the surface, but having metallic conductivity. Moreover, there is something interesting. If you are a physicist, physicists really paid very little attention to metals. Metals are boring. You cannot 
change the move the Fermi level, unlike semiconductors, where all the modern electronic is based on using semiconductors because you can apply external stimulus like a potential and change their properties. In maxines, you can do the same. Those are metals when with external stimulus you can shift Fermi level, changing position of plasma resonance, changing their conductivity, changing a variety of their properties. So we believe it will be revolutionary and people already come with a term actually maxitronics, uh, Hussam Al-Sharif uh, from Kaust University, building a new type, new generation of electronic devices using those materials. So what do we have nowadays? We actually have a family with already at least 30 stoichiometric two-dimensional structures produced experimentally in the lab, about 100, at least 100 possible. So those are these modern transition metal maxines, as I mentioned, M2X, M3X2, M4X3. But they can form solid solution. You can actually, on M side, mix different atoms. For example, vanadium and titanium, or moly and tungsten. And they form really any number of solid solutions. So it's pretty much we're facing an infinite number of compositions that we can design. We produce just in my lab, and I study now about 25 different solid solutions here. They also can be on excite. We call them carbon nitride, carbon nitride. But moreover, we can take atomistic design to the next level and make atomic sandwiches. When one element, like moly, is in the surface, titanium is in the middle. So the surface element will largely determine surface chemistry of the material, their catalytic properties, energy storage ability, sorption, and others, while the metal in the middle, which is a bit monolayer or double layer, will largely determine electronic property of this material. And this is not all. Scientists in Sweden and Lichopin University produced this type of materials where you have atomic column on one element, for example, yttrium or scandium, and two atomic column of another element uh, here. Those are these materials. And if you remove one of those layers, this one, you can actually end up with ordered divacancy maxine. And we have a paper under review that adds now the fourth column to it, M5X4 structure. An undergraduate student in my group produced a new family, a subfamily of maxines. So we are just in the beginning of the story when we atom by atom design an almost infinite number of novel materials here. And this is why it's exciting and that's why it will require efforts in many, many researchers. And this is an opportunity for especially younger scientists in this room here. So it's fine. It's good to have many materials. It's good to have bricks or Lego stones of uh, different colors that you can build a nice structure. But we already had many materials. Do we need more? Well, as I already mentioned, they do have some properties that others don't have. And again, high metallic conductivity is truly important for many applications. People like to tell that graphene is a great conductor. Well, it's actually a zero band gap semiconductor with very few carriers. And you have to dope it, create defects to produce carriers in the material. Those materials have high density of state at the Fermi level and high concentration of carriers. As a result, if you don't want a monolayer graphene, but make a film out of graphene, what most applications really require, from reducing graphene oxide, mechanics foliated graphite, you actually add up with conductivity of about, say, 2,000 cement per centimeter. We get up to 20,000 in titanium 3C2 maxine right now. They're hydrophilic. They're soluble in water. You can take a bottle like this, put some material, dissolve, and do all the processing from aqueous solutions. Moreover, they come in every color possible. Plasmonic colors that can be used for electrochromic coatings, films, like for example, um, uh, windows in uh, Boeing Dreamliner uh, or Airbus uh, 380. 
uh, where you can, by applying small potential, change the color, making darker here. And there are many, many other applications that we're exploring thanks to those properties. I'm going to give you a few examples today. But one thing I wanted to mention, which is really important here. If you look at the band structure of, say, this is example for titanium 2C, one of the uh, first discovered, actually, uh, same time discovered, but published a little bit after titanium 3C2. You see there is a high density of state at the Fermi level when material is terminated by uh, uh, non-terminated, sorry, with no surface here. If we change the termination, we put termination fluorine on the surface, the density of state you see decreases. But if you put oxygen on the surface and pull two electrons from every titanium atom, like in titanium 2CO2 structure, you can even open the band gap in this material. So this is what I mean under materials with tunable band structure. Some of Maxine at this table shows have actually been predicted to be semiconductors, but they have been not really much studied yet because there are plenty of semiconducting materials available in 2D. Still, I'm pretty sure we'll find some interesting properties there here. So there have been many other properties predicted. Magnetic maxines, we're exploring two-dimensional magnetism now in maxine. Giant Zeebe coefficient means potentially useful thermoelectric material among semiconductors. Dirac fermions have been predicted in tenium uh, to see terminated fluorine, so cones like in the band structure of graphene. Ultra-low work function, actually work function tuning is already used in perovskite solar cells. And uh, topological insulator, many, many others here. So, those materials have this wealth of attractive properties here. How do we make them? That's again very important because some of materials can be made, but nanomaterials in nano quantities. And this is not enough for technology usually here. So we actually take ceramic materials that Professor Barzum, my colleague at Jersey University, discovered. Uh, or he really not discovered it here. They were discovered by Novotny and others in 1960s, but he developed them as a field of materials. Those are these materials from layers of carbide, mono, double, triple layer, separated by layer of these blue atoms, which are A element. They're called max phases. So M elements are elements of this red one that we use in maxine, X carbon nitrogen, and this blue are atoms of A element. And in my group, we have been working for many years doing selective etching. For example, removing silicon or titanium from silicon or titanium carbide to make porous carbon structure. This is how graphene was initially produced by heating silicon carbide crystals in vacuum to high temperatures, removing silicon atoms and leaving just carbon behind here. So what we did, we etched A element layers leaving just carbide layers behind. And as a result, all these materials were produced. So we take ceramic powder, dump it in solution. Initially, we use HF. Now we can use a variety of different agents. We can etch electrochemically. We can etch uh, in emulsion salts. And this A element atoms, the blue ones, get dissolved. What we have now, we have maxine layers which are still bonded to each other. You see, this picture looks like a thermally exfoliated graphite or vermiculite clay. But now they're bonded by weak hydrogen bonds because there are OH or oxygen or fluorine groups on the surface. So we can disperse them just the same way we disperse graphene oxide, clay, uh, or other materials because now there is a weak bonding. One important thing is here. You cannot really easily mechanically exfoliate those material because those not Van der Waals are strong uh, covalent uh, or uh, metallic bonds, depending on what kind of element is used, so we have to edge them. But because of this, we actually can produce large amount of materials. So what you see here, uh, dark brown, it's not chocolate. This is maxine produced from a single etching in a reactor, which was designed by us by Material Research Center and produced uh, in Kiev, Ukraine. We have one liter and they made also two liter reactors. And what it means is that you can make 100 gram of two-dimensional material. You make it in a monolayer, you can cover a stadium surface with material made 
from a single batch in the lab. Moreover, not only simple maxine, this is titanium-3, the most common one, but this atomic sandwich is like moly-2 titanium-2 with moly on the surface, titanium in the middle, can be produced as well, and this is an undergraduate student, uh, Pavel Lev, uh, holding about 40 gram in a petri dish of this material. And this is very important. Many nanomaterials cannot be produced in large quantities. Moreover, there are just a few of them. Bes uh, aside from clay, graphene, boron nitride, moly disulfide, hardly any can be made in sufficient quantities for practical application many here. Those materials are scalable, and this is very important. Moreover, what is also very useful in majority of applications is that we don't need uh, toxic uh, solvents uh, to disperse them, because unlike hydrophobic uh, graphite or graphene, they can be dissolved just in water, because uh, going back to uh, your chemistry uh, background, if there is a zeta potential which is below minus 30 roughly millivolt or above plus 30, material forms stable colloidal solution. So you see it near neutral pH, Maxine will, and this is titanium 3 to the example, form a nice colloidal solution. So they should have high surface negative charge. They basically act as Lewis acids. And some of them go down to minus 80 millivolt because of all these free electrons of metals inside. And also you see one liter bottles with uh, different solution of different maxines. We can uh, take them. And if you have a solution, you can process it in any way you want. My students bought for about $20 a spray gun for paint uh, from a hardware store. Uh, this is one of my students uh, 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 holding a bottle uh, with uh, maxine solution. You see they're filling uh, the spray gun and spraying it on the surface here. As a result of spraying, you can get this, uh, that you can see in the background, sheet of uh, maxine, this is actually maxine with graphene, uh, mix it uh, for a composite material. You can see it's a five micron scene, but you can see uh, that it's a freestanding and separated from the surface. And depending on amount of graphene, in this case, we had about one to 10,000 siemens per centimeter. Actually, more graphene reduces graphene oxide you add, lower is the conductivity. Uh, but we need it for energy storage purposes. And this is another student, uh, uh, Kathleen Maleski, holding uh, Drexel University logo sprayed coated. So again, nanotechnology does not need to be nano quantity or uh, billion uh, dollar uh, worth in expenses to build it here. You see, we use ceramic powder. We use cheap acid, for example, like a high HCl and fluoride salt, like lithium fluoride 2H here. And we use a $20, I'm pretty sure in India it's probably even less expensive. Spray gun, the same you would basically use to uh, paint uh, walls uh, or paint something else in your house to produce nanomaterials with conductivity exceeding pretty much any uh, two-dimensional material solution processes that is known here. And this again shows that you don't need some kind of a super sophisticated equipment to do uh, novel uh, work and make novel materials here. But if you take a sophisticated, more expensive piece of equipment like electron microscope, a look inside, what you see, you will find flakes like this one, uh, several microns in size. And this one follows actually hexagonal symmetry of precursor phase, max phase. And those are monolayers of maxine laying here. Here a couple of layers are overlapping. And if you magnify it further, you will see that each of them has ordered lattice and they are single crystals and this diffraction pattern shows. So we have flakes which are freestanding. But what is interesting actually, they may look very similar to what you see from some graphene or moly disulfide. But you will not get a picture like that, for example, because graphene will right away drop. It's a flimsy thin. Bending rigidity of maxines because of just few atoms thicker layer is significantly larger, so it can actually stay uh, suspended and keep the shape much better. And actually, it is actually pretty tough because carbides of transition metals are known and used, for example, as very resistant materials. Cutting tool, titanium carbide, tungsten carbide. So when you test 
And this work was done with colleagues from the University of Nebraska Lincoln, monolayers or double layer of maxine. You can find they're really very, very strong. And the ideal layer of boron nitride or graphene will actually show high modules of high strength, but those are ideals that manually removed from a single crystal. If you take reduces graphene oxide, graphene oxide, molydisulfide, the very first one, titanium 3 true was already has a high Young's modulus. We tested Neubium 3 now, Neubium 4C3. And it has about 430 uh, gigapascal modulus and about 30 gigapascal strengths. So those are very strong materials to add here. And we can select them by different particle sizes for different applications, and we can print them. And again, we can print even in different colors if you want, and print devices just from aqueous ink here. And for example, this is a picture of uh, Professor Mildred Dusselhaus, uh, uh, grand uh, lady of uh, carbon science. My student printed when she passed away in uh, 2017. Uh, actually, it was not even printed, it was painted with a Maxine automatic pen. So we can take a fountain pen or uh, you can uh, take a rollerball and basically just fill it uh, with uh, this Maxine ink and make a conductive pattern. You can see an LED uh, light uh, in a contact uh, with this picture here. And of course, you can process them now just like any other solution process to the materials can make fibers, for example, those are by scrolled fibers. Uh, we can make liquid crystalline structures and align them in different ways like a liquid crystals. We can make fibers, actually draw fibers and use them as uh, heating elements, uh, just like metal wires. We can incorporate these materials in polymer matrix, ceramic matrix, or metal matrix composite, use them as a reinforcement, or in case of ceramic, also conducting additives, which not only increases mechanical properties, but also adds conductivity to the materials here. But what is also important, they have very exciting optical properties. I mentioned briefly in the beginning that it's actually metal, but metal with tunable properties. If you look at this, UV spectra, you will see absorption peaks, and particularly this one, it's a plasmon resonance in titanium 3C2. But you see for different composition, you will see plasmon resonance in different places, and this is actually give different color of materials. Moreover, for some of them, they will go much further into infrared range beyond that. And you can actually tune them by applying just one volt potential, negative potential, to mix in with an electrolyte between the layers. We can shift it by, in this case, it's shown 100 nanometers. So basically going from transparent film, which would be green to blue color, and we actually go up to 150, 160 nanometer with just one volt applied potential. So it's again, it's a very interesting metal with tunable properties, tunable optical properties, tunable electronic properties. And as a result, of course, they start finding applications in solar cells, all of these, femtosecond and random lasers, plasmonics, photodetectors, many other applications. For example, just like about two months ago, we published a paper on using tunable work function, which is again can be changed and modified by changes of extermination. And same time, another group uh, from Italy and Russian mix, uh, Russia mixed group published another paper using actually exactly the same principle here. So it shows how quickly research is growing and propagating. I mentioned just a couple of minutes ago that many maxine have plasma resonance, so they basically absorb light and transform it into heat in infrared range. So they can be used as light to heat uh, transforming materials. And big applications they found is photothermal therapy, destroying cancer cells by illuminating them with red light because, for example, titanium 3C2 has plasma resonance at 780 nanometers. This is exactly position for red uh, diode uh, laser. So it's a very, very common one, and it can go much, much deeper into tissue compared to uh, visible light, uh, which had to be used, for example, with gold nanoparticles. Moreover, many maxines have plasma resonance much, much uh, further into infrared, so infrared radiation can be used to heat it here. 
many other applications. They are very good sorbent. For example, in this application, you can also absorb drug like doxorubicin on the surface, and whatever cells won't be uh, killed by heat can be destroyed here. They can absorb urea. Uh, we're working on building artificial kidney because of this. They can be used as gas sensors. And in my group, and actually uh, session chair shows that I just have five minutes left here, but in my group we primarily work on application of different nanomaterials in energy storage. This review article was actually published just last Friday, uh, very, very recently. It's not dedicated just Maxine, it's about all nanomaterials for energy storage here. And of course, our host also published a review article just today, I discovered in the morning looking at Maxine's uh, as uh, new materials uh, for also supercapacitor electro application, our favorite topic. So I'm delighted to see uh, research ongoing uh, at uh, VAT here. So let me just use a remaining couple of minutes to explain briefly why they are good for this purpose. Because what do you need to store energy? You need to be able to transfer electrons in a battery or pseudo capacitor we call materials. And I already mentioned the outer layer transition metal, which can change oxidation state as you apply potential if you bring ions to the surface. But this material can also transport electrons in the middle layer. But between the layers, here you have a model showing water molecules, and here water molecules with potassium ions, you can transport ions. So you have basically material that has metallic conductivity, ionic conductivity, and capable of changing oxidation state. That's exactly what you want from a good materials for energy storage. Moreover, you know, like, uh, Elon Musk promised that Tesla batteries will be charged within five to 10 minutes uh, when you come to a charging station. What does it mean quick charging? It means very simple thing. You have to run very high current through the battery. And currently, people use, for example, oxide material for cathodes. And even graphite that you use for nanodots is not very conductive. So what happens if you apply a run high current through a resistor? It just heats up and explodes. So this is type of material we exactly need to have very fast charging, high charging. And actually, thin film of Maxine can be charged with a rate 100 volts per second, so basically in millisecond time here. And moreover, we can work also on uh, uh, making, for example, Maxine uh, supercapacitor and battery embedded in textile, and I'm, you're going to hear a talk today in the afternoon from uh, uh, Professor Thomas uh, from uh, University of Central Florida about uh, energy produced, generating, and storing textiles. They can be made into transparent semiconductors. This is our work with Trinity College, uh, with Valeria Nicolosi's group. Uh, and again, because the volumetric capacitances are high. And you can do a lot of other things. So far, this is probably the best electromagnetic shielding material available. Now we pushed, actually, it's protecting properties above copper. But what is important for achieving about uh, 50 uh, decibel, we can just have one micron film of material instead of uh, metal foils with about 10 to 20 micron thickness that you use nowadays. And for wearable electronic, Internet of Things device is important. We can make printable antennas for 5G internet. RFID tags with much larger distance uh, uh, interaction here. So there are many, many applications and this diagram shows. Moreover, Many of the field, like a sensors, biomedical application, first paper were published just about like a two years ago. So all the results I show to you, it's not like a result of optimization of properties of material. They are the first results available. There is plenty of room for improvement. As you see now, there are already, according to Web of Science, more than 800 institutions from more than 50 countries published papers. Google uh, uh, patents shows more than 800 patents filed for the materials. So field is really growing, exploding. We had 450 attendees in the Maxine conference in Beijing uh, in May this year. So to summarize what we have, we have this new large emerging family of materials with many members, with tunable properties. Moreover, we can tune composition of material. We can tune also surface chemistry 
to further fine-tune the properties of the materials here. Of course, materials are new. We have more questions than answers to be addressed. There is a lot to learn. And that's again, let me repeat you, for so many different materials, it's not something any research group can do. It requires entire community. It requires people working in different fields and exploring different applications, different properties. Methods of synthesis by, for example, chemical vapor deposition. There are other structures that have been predicted to exist among nitrites, carbides, also borides. So again, there is plenty of room to explore here. And finally, I would like to show people who really did all this work. Those are my students and postdocs. And actually, research in energy storage is led by a very good scientist from India, Narendra Kura. Uh, this is this guy. He is actually currently also uh, is my right hand, uh, helping me uh, to manage my lab. For example, when I'm traveling, uh, like uh, this week, uh, he is looking for a faculty position in India. So if you know that your institution has one, consider this guy. He is really good. Uh, moreover, we have many, many collaborators, many people who work with us to study properties of these materials, to explore applications. I don't know everything. I am not an expert in everything. And I always try to work with people who know more than me and explore those applications. Again, thank you to many funding agencies. And you see there are US, but also many foreign uh, entities that support our research. Moreover, we have been working for several years with Murata Corporation, which is like a, a Fortune 1000 company in Japan, one of the leading electronic manufacturers that is scaling up Maxine technology and already has several products ready. Finally, before I end, uh, two advertisements. One is we just launched recently MS program in nanomaterials. We are looking for excellent students uh, willing to join. And I left a whole bunch of brochures uh, also not only on this MS program, but on graduate programs at Drexel in engineering in general with the organizers. I'm sure they will be available at the registration desk or elsewhere as the organizer if you want to one. Also, as one of the uh, editors of ICS Nano, uh, I need to give a pitch uh, for this journal. Those are actually Maxine, this, uh, Maxine Atomic Sandwiches are published uh, in ACS Nano. If you have a full-size article, which is really good, reporting really novel research, we certainly want to have more publication from India and ACS Nano. And this is my very last slide. <laughs> uh, if you feel that it's something you may wish to explore a little bit deeper, let me give you a few references from our group. There are many other review papers. I just showed you one uh, from uh, Dr. Nirmala Grace uh, uh, published uh, today. But this review is getting aged a little bit, but it's a good starting point going beyond the editorial I showed in the beginning. We have two topical reviews. And actually, next year, there will be three conferences on vaccines in China and the US. And our book just got published. Uh, so again, if you want to delve really deep into Maxine's, get the book from Springer. And with this, thank you very much for your attention. OK, let's thank you. Very good. For this proud overview of Maxine properties. Mm -hmm. So now the paper is open for a few questions. Please, are there questions? OK. Thank you for the new materials and new directions. Uh, I was just wondering the conductivity of these materials you have shown uh, must be room temperature very high uh, at 20,000 mm -hmm. uh, Siemens per centimeter. Mm -hmm. But has it been measured with temperature variation? The conductivity variation with temperature? Well, it really will depend. Oops, I don't have any extra slide to show. Uh, the metallic one will show conductivity uh, basically increasing with decreasing temperature until about typically 50 Kelvin where defects in this material lead to the rise, just like in 2D metals. Okay. But the ones that are semiconductor, actually you can get seven orders of magnitude in conductivity, they will show semiconductor-like behavior with resistivity rising with decreasing temperature. And we know also by annealing inside the microscope, transmission electron microscope, we had a page, paper in Nature Communication earlier this year, that it's possible to remove functional groups and 
changed from semiconductor behavior to metal-like behavior here. So it really depends on change. What is also interesting for titanium 32, and we don't know exactly really why, there is very, very weak temperature dependence. So if someone is looking for materials with a very stable temperature characteristic of conductivity, there is almost no change in conductivity over uh, basically from room temperature to 100 degrees C or down to minus uh, uh, 100 uh, degrees C here. Thank Sorry. you. Professor, it's an excellent lecture. Thank so you. actually, I have small questions uh, regarding the electrochemistry of your MX since, since one of the best uh, applications for this MX since are supercapacitors. How do you compare with the carbon-based materials? Well, again, um, for people who are uh, less familiar uh, with the field, uh, there are basically double air capacitors, are actually double air capacitors, where quick charge storage is possible because of a double layer formed on this porous material surface. And there are materials which are called pseudo capacitors that charge quickly and charge store on the surface, but there is a redox process. So maxines are really redox capacitors. And they show very, very high rate and enormous, actually, like an orders of magnitude larger capacitance almost uh, in uh, uh, sulfuric acid electrolyte. But we can get about 300 farad per cubic centimeter in organic electrolyte. We have a paper in Nature Energy earlier this year. So you can go beyond carbon. Still, the carbon has an advantage is in the number of cycle. Because of redox, we can go far, but not as far as carbon at the moment. We need to work on this. And one thing I also wanted to mention at the end. I was comparing Maxine showing where it has advantages uh, over graphene, for example. Not to say that graphene is useless, stop working, uh, it will never be used. I just was sh trying to show where Maxine can add something to existing materials, to exist properties of existing materials, and I think, so they add something to the palette. So if you need more energy, and actually even faster charging than carbon, activated carbon, maxine are good. If you need very long cycle life, carbon materials can still do better, at least at the moment. Thank you. Uh, hello, Professor. Uh, it's a um, uh, good opportunity for me, uh, just uh, I hear you. So my question, uh, you are just uh, talking about the uh, maxine. So did you check this uh, study for the uh, photoelectrochemical water splitting also? Because uh, uh, we have we have done some HR work again with collaborators. Yes, sir. With Alex Vavodis from University of Pennsylvania and a group from Stanford. They are very good. Molly carbide, actually a very good electrocatalyst. Uh, and uh, moreover, you can use vacancies on the surface of maxine layers to place, uh, for example, platinum atoms. And then you can do better than platinum on carbon with those materials here. Uh, there are also other groups that work on uh, like a full cycle splitting, yeah. but oxidation of maxine under uh, uh, anodic potentials can actually be a danger. But for HR, definitely it's a good material, and carbides have been known to be a pretty well, good actually. catalyst, uh, but in this case, you just have advantage of large surface area. And one more important thing, if you take, for example, molybdenum sulfide, only edges are catalytically active. In Maxine, it has been shown the entire surface can work as a catalyst. So this is one of the advantages compared to Dutchel carginides. Okay, thank you. Thanks for an excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so my question is, you said that you can tune the Fermi energy level, right? right? Mm -hmm. So for, you know, tuning the Fermi energy level is very important for optoelectronic mm -hmm. applications. So yeah. How can you do that? Is there a, a charge transfer or you apply yes. voltage? It's largely charge transfer. Uh, let me just explain. Actually, it's a very, very simple. What happens, for example, in this case, uh, when we do this shift here? We electrochemically change the chemistry, surface chemistry of material here, like Schorscher. So basically, OH will take one electron from a titanium atom. But if you change it between oxygen and H, and you can do it at minus 0.5 volt, you basically 
take or give away an electron. So you basically inject electron or take away electrons. So it's a very, very simple way of doing it. It's very reversible. We can run for uh, tens of thousands of cycles. And this is one of the ways of uh, uh, playing uh, with this surface uh, chemistry. Or yes, uh, roughly uh, in that range here. But also, of course, you can change it permanently. And this was done in the case of uh, uh, solar cells to basically, by changing surface chemistry, OH will actually take it uh, to about uh, 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 roughly probably uh, minus uh, two, but fluorine can drop it down to minus eight. So basically, it's a, a lot. We cannot do it reversibly. At least we don't know how to do it reversibly, fluorine, hydrogen. But oxygen right in the middle, like a pound five. So in this range, it's a pretty easy to tune uh, by, for example, like a drying it, uh, heating it, removing uh, hydrogen from the surface. Or we can get more fluorinated material by using HF. So this is a range we can play with. We published a paper in chemistry of material or basically tuning uh, work function of Maxine's uh, earlier this year. Sir, I have one more application-based question. The Maxine supercapacity is using for the biomedical applications or uh, implantable wearable device application is possible? Implantable what? Uh, like for the pacemaker and uh, uh, continuous glucose parameter for sensor applications. Um, I'm not uh, quite sure in this end, but uh, let me just uh, answer as instant here. Oh, okay, okay. I think so, I don't think uh, why not, uh, because two reasons. First, we do work on implantable electrodes with Maxine. Titanium-3, at least titanium-2, are non-toxic and actually biocompatible, blood compatible as well. So we work with the University of Pennsylvania group on exploring like a brain electrodes or other applications. And of course, Today, people already make implantable battery supercapacitors, so if you package and put a device, say, inside their body, I don't think any reason uh, why not. Again, lifetime and uh, other properties need to be uh, evaluated because you don't want to remove implants uh, frequently uh, if you put it inside the body. But otherwise, I think uh, it should be doable. Yuri, you are, uh, <clears throat> yeah, my shielding is very interesting. Did you try to do some hybrid structures, I mean, with uh, nickel or uh, nickel uh, monolayer and uh, I mean, 3D um, structures, or did you also try to make some nanocomposite with polymers for uh, uh, efficient EMI shielding? Mm -hmm. It's very interesting value you have showed today, actually. I have uh, no idea uh, where my slide is uh, gone with EMI shielding, but then, okay, it's here. Yeah. It's actually kind of a very interesting. This is the very first paper on Maxine, 2016. Uh, published with Chon Min Koo from Korea Institute of Science Technology. This is the very first paper on MI shielding in science or nature family journal ever because nothing was happening really in the field novel. So it was really a breakthrough in the field. Uh, this technology has already been licensed, already is, you'll probably find it very soon in your cell phone when you buy new generation cell phones here. But what is important? Yes, it's possible to incorporate in polymer, and we do it, and actually we have done here with sodium alginate, not because it's a great polymer, because Chen Min Ko was pa passing by uh, Drexel University, just like you visited. We gave him some sample of battery electrodes. Couple of weeks later, he sent an email and look, we tested this material. This is the best material ever. Uh, we tested in our lab here. So we can reach 20 decibel, which is sufficient for many applications, 99% of absorption of electromagnetic radiation or reflection, it with 40 to 50 nanometer film of maxine, which is amazing. With adding polymer or increasing change in spacing, it's possible to change the ratio between absorption and reflection of electromagnetic radiation. We did not do really mixing with, uh, with uh, magnetic materials, but several groups published research. Uh, this paper has already like has uh, more than 500 citations. Uh, I think about 500 citations just last year, in the past year. So it's growing very quickly. It's about 1,000 citations now already. So people have been exploring all kind of basically EMI shielding combination with Maxine's now. 
and uh, we know even better materials at the moment which have not been published yet. Okay. Oh, <laughs> last question. <laughs> is very famous in magazine. You are maybe a pioneer of that work. But just my, the industrial point of view I'm asking because carbon is well known. Maxwell is developing the supercapacitor commercially. Then how the magazine is comparable to the price as well as the energy density in unit volume? Oh, look, there are two things. First, in energy density, it's very good actually. One of the reasons is carbon is light. And in some applications, this is an advantage. But if you have a cell phone, or a battery in any device. Size is really critical. So when I'm talking about volumetric, maxines are roughly in an electrode assemble, four or five times heavier than carbon. So if you get the same even 100, 200 farad per gram, you are basically like a thousand and fifteen uh, hundred farad per cubic centimeter capacitance. So that is just price. At the moment, it's expensive, like any material produced pretty much in laboratory. But as I try to convince you, whenever you take a material with uh, abundant element, titanium, titanium is used to paint walls again. There is, well, there's probably white color is titanium dioxide, and it's the same carbon. So at large scale production, there is no reason why it should be expensive. But it's typically always go from small volume applications, uh, value added applications to large applications. So technology for electronic supercapacitor for small devices have already been licensed and actually entire supercapacitor application have been exclusively licensed already. But I would say supercapacitor for cell phone, absolutely reality today gives you a couple of uh, four times more uh, uh, capacitance compared to carbon. Supercapacitor for a bus? No, not yet. Five years down the road, 10 years down the road, possible. Okay, so uh, I have the impression that this discussion can be very, very long, but it's time to stop because we lunch have to time. go to lunch. I'm standing but between you and lunch, I know. To say that uh, uh, it would be around in these days, so then if you want to continue the discussion, please approach him and you, you will get very exhaustive answer from me. So then I would like to thank uh, Yuri Gagossi for his talk and for all, for all the time that he dedicated to answer your question. And also I want to thank also once more Anna that for, uh, for her talk of this book. Okay, so with this, the first session, the opening session of this conference is closed, and now I suppose there are announce other announcements. Yeah. Now, it's time to end the session. I thank everyone for being very patient with us. Please enjoy, please join us for the lunch from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. at the Foodies.